This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by TopTal. Experience a new way of hiring as TopTal delivers only the top 3% of applicants, including highly skilled blockchain engineers. If you're looking to scale your team with the very best talent, visit toptal.com slash epicenter. And by Microsoft Azure. Do you have an idea for a blockchain app but are worried about the time and cost it will take to develop? The new Azure Blockchain Dev Kit is a free download that brings together the tools you need to get your first app running in less than 30 minutes. Learn more at aka.ms slash epicenter. Hi, and welcome to Epicenter. My name is Brian Farman Crane. And my name is Sonny Agarwal. So we're here today with Christian Decker. He's been on the uh, podcast before, and we're going to speak a, a lot about the Lightning Network. So this is really exciting. I think one of the things uh when we did our kind of recap of last year that i brought up is oh i really want to do more bitcoin episodes there seems to be it's just more momentum there and so many interesting things happening and we have been sort of undercovering bitcoin so i'm really glad that now we've we've done uh, another bitcoin episode and uh, two in a row in fact two in a row yes yes (laughs) yeah we were joking before the episode maybe we have to put the bitcoin back in the name but no (laughs) Yeah, so I, I'm I, I feel very yeah excited about Bitcoin, and I thought it was a great conversation to learn a bit about Lightning. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, Lightning is such a big project, and you know we haven't actually done a Lightning episode on Epicenter since like 2015. So this is really good because it got a lot of updates on the status and development, and so really great episode. So you mentioned you also have some announcements to make. You're gonna uh, give a talk tomorrow. Yeah, so uh, there's a panel uh, in Berkeley uh, being held by Blockchain at Berkeley, uh, an order, an organization I used to uh, be part of. Um, it's called uh, Blockchain for a Social Impact. And so it should be a very interesting panel uh, talking with a bunch of different people, some people from the Open Money Initiative. We're going to be there talking a lot about, you know, Venezuela and stuff. But uh, it should just uh, overall be a really interesting panel. Uh, it's going to be tomorrow, uh, or I guess if this episode coming out tomorrow, today uh, on the 6th. February 6th in Berkeley, California. Um, and if you can't make it out, uh, you know, uh, the recording will be available and we'll probably tweet it out from our Epicenter uh, Twitter account. Cool. And then let's go to the conversation with Christian. Hi, we're here today with Christian Decker. He has been on the podcast before. It was actually quite some time ago, I think around three years, three and a half years ago, where we did an episode with him about uh, a paper he had written called the Duplex Payment Channel. So if you if you want to check out that episode, uh, that's number one hundred and six. So and uh, and he's been working on Bitcoin for a long time. He was the first person to do a PhD about Bitcoin, and then he did a bunch of academic papers, including the, this work on payment channels, which was you know very much related to or kind of similar to Lightning in many ways. And then Christian joined, uh, shortly after we did the podcast, he joined um, the Blockstream team and he's been doing a lot of work uh, on, I think, primarily Lightning for Blockstream. So we're, yeah, we're excited to have Christian on today and, and to have a chance to dive into Lightning where I think so much has happened. And of course, yeah, uh, we've done a few episodes, but actually they were mostly in 2015, so a long time ago. So yeah, thanks so much for coming on, Christian. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Uh, excited to be back. It's been a while. Yeah, it has been a while. So people should go to the last episode and hear this in more detail, but maybe we can just briefly recap. So how did you originally get into Bitcoin and how did you end up doing like the first PhD ever on the topic? I was doing a master in distributed computing and distributed systems back in uh, 2009. And I stumbled over this strange small paper and i thought wait this is this is interesting um and so i've i went to the online forums and registered there and and started discussing with people and uh for a long time it was just just sort of this thing that was in my in the back of my mind and um then at some point in 2012 it was about time to uh to choose a topic for my phd and uh, i decided uh, that Bitcoin might be worth 
giving it a shot. And uh, since nobody was believing that Bitcoin might still be around in three years time, which is the usual time it takes for a PhD to complete, I was uh, was careful to uh, to make it blockchain and Bitcoin and uh, uh, sort of uh, line up a whole slew of, uh, of different uh, topics that we might try to uh, to look at and including scalability. And it turns out that, uh, yeah, the, the whole scalability topic was really popular. And uh, that's what I basically did my, my entire PhD on. Um, and it ended up uh, uh, be, uh, being successful in 2016. And uh, um, I... Uh, was uh, was awarded the first PhD in about Bitcoin in, in the world, um, and uh, yeah, been working on that stuff ever since. And so you said you started the PhD in two thousand twelve, though, like working on it. Yeah, and and already back then, you say scalability was uh, kind of a very popular topic. Oh yeah, I mean it. Uh, it was, among other things, uh, uh, one of the parts that I outlined in, in sort of my pitch to my professor that, that I want, uh, of topics that I wanted to discuss. And the scalability topic was very much in mind. Uh, it is, uh, I, I mean, we, we were a distributed computing and distributed systems group. So scalability quite quickly comes to mind when, uh, when, when you're talking about this kind of, uh, of system. And... Uh, from just looking from the outside, it was pretty clear that uh, this will not scale to infinite uh, transactions uh, and infinite participants, in at least in its current form. Um, and that's also something that that we uh, that we discovered um, while working on it. That yeah, scaling scaling blockchains is hard. So. Um, yeah, we, we ended up uh, sort of sidestepping the entire uh, scalability uh, discussion and uh, uh, and going for systems that squeeze more out of the, the resources that we have. And that's where basically payment channels and duplex micropayment channels and Lightning came, uh, came from, basically using the resources that we have in a more efficient way. Very cool. And so um, the last time you were on the uh, show, we, you were on talking about duplex uh, payment channels, and so you were still working on your thesis back then. Uh, so, and then you know, very soon after that episode, you decided to join Blockstream. Uh, how did you know what made you decide to go join them, and like uh, instead of like you know met any of the other companies working in the space? And how did you uh, shift your work from your duplex work uh, into uh, Lightning specifically? The idea to join uh, the Lightning effort uh, was pretty pretty an easy one. Uh, I mean, uh, for duplex market payment channels, I was sort of, sort of the sole person pushing for it, and there's little value in uh, in having two competing systems, uh, sp sort of splitting users among them. The true utility from from such a payment network come, it really comes from there being one big uh, network where every every participant can speak to every other participant, right? So splitting the splitting the community into into smaller parts is not not ideal. Um, and secondly, there, there, uh, well, duplex micropayment channels and uh, Lightning had uh, have really different trade-offs. Uh, I think at the time, Lightning had uh, had way better uh, trade-offs than than duplex micropayment channels, and that that is apparent from uh, from just looking at sort of the uh, on-chain footprint that uh, duplex micropayment channels have uh, compared to Lightning uh, channels. Uh, with duplex micropayment channels, we had tens of transactions that we needed to settle in a certain period of time. Whereas in Lightning, we just have to settle one transaction. That is uh, um, so. Lightning is is more complex, um, but at the same time, it uh, it sort of uses the scarce resources a bit more efficient. Um, that is not to say that that we can't claw back some of the good parts of duplex micropayment channels and. Uh, that's that's part of what uh, what we published last year uh, uh, with this L two proposal, which maybe we we'll talk about later. So, like you know, L two is sort of like a lot of your duplex work, kind of like making its way back into Lightning. Is that a fair way of saying that? Uh, it's it's heavily inspired by by the duplex micropayment channel stuff. Yes, cool. Uh, it, it sort of is going back one step and, uh, and looking at how we would structure a blockchain if we wanted to have native payment channels on top of it. 
And then basically realizing that, yeah, the stuff that we just need to change in Bitcoin is really tiny and, uh, and sort of everything else followed naturally from there. And we sort of can get back some of the nice features of, of, L, uh, of duplex microphone channels with L2 then later. So now this is uh, maybe a tricky task, but I, I think I suspect a lot of listeners are familiar with Lightning on this kind of very abstract level, or they certainly have heard of Lightning, but they may not have a good understanding of how it works. Now, without going into too much detail here, like how do you explain Lightning to somebody who, let's say, understands Bitcoin well, but doesn't understand Lightning? Sure, yeah. Uh, so um, light, uh, a Lightning channel is basically a construction of a payment channel, and the payment channel is nothing else than a, a relationship between two endpoints uh, basically deciding on how to settle a certain balance. So. Um, the usual example I give is that I that I go to a bar and I put a ten dollar bill on the on the counter, and as long as this ten dollar bill is on the counter, me and the barista basically we uh, we're sure that this ten dollar bill can't move. And now it's uh, it's all about initially these ten dollars are mine, and then I want to transact with the barista, and and so we we in, uh, we incrementally decide on. Um, on how to split these 10 bucks. So if I buy a very cheap beer for $1, then sort of our agreement is that out of these $10, $1 is his and nine are mine. And then I buy one more and then basically $2 are his and eight are mine. Um, notice that the dollar bill never moves during all of this. Uh, all of this. I only give the barista the assurance that if I were to, uh, uh, if we were to settle, then he would get his two dollars. And much of the much of the complicated parts of uh, of the protocol are are, are about basically uh, assuring my counterparty that yes, if uh, if nothing goes, if uh, uh, in any uh, in any possible outcome, he will get his money and I will get mine. And that uh, we can't sort of renege on what our, what our latest state was. Basically, uh, if I uh, if I promise him two dollars, then he will get two dollars, and we can't go back to a previous state where I had nine and he had only had one. So this is basically just the idea of a channel where we have some funds that are locked up or allocated to our channel, and now we discuss uh, uh, repeatedly on how we want to settle these. And uh, that's that sort of an old idea that we had for a long time. Basically, already in 2011, we had the uh, the Spielmann a unidirectional uh, channel construction, which allowed us to sort of send money into this one direction and never never receive it back. With the with duplex micropayment channels and the Lightning Network, suddenly we have a construction where we can send back uh, money back and forth in both uh, directions. Uh, in a secure way, such that uh, we can we can always be sure that that we'll get uh, our uh, what what is uh, what is due to us. Now, with Lightning, Lightning is is, is the first part. Uh, the network part is the second part, right? Uh, if I if I open a channel with a barista, I can only interact with that barista. Uh, but if uh, if we were to create a network of these payment channels and uh, make sure that through a transitive relationship, I can reach any other party uh, party in the network. Then we could basically say, "Hey, I will give you one dollar if you forward this one dollar to the next per person in the chain, and the next person in the chain, and the next person in the chain, until we eventually reach our uh, our intended target. And only then we can uh, we uh, we have this entire chain of uh, promises that there are then fulfilled. There's ways to to do that." But uh, really, those are those are two uh, par uh, parts of the protocol that uh, make up the Lightning Network: the payment channels themselves, and this way of uh, sending uh, uh, payments over multiple hops in this network. So the Lightning white paper, right? the original Lightning white paper, was I think around four years ago that it was uh, it came out. So has this idea changed a lot since then? You know, as as people work, maybe some of things turned out wrong, or like how current is the the white paper from back then? 
it's very much the same and completely different at the same time. I think the, 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 the basic ideas are still there. The revolutionary idea of, uh, of constructing a, a payment channel and then sort of the way we, uh, we do invalidation of all states uh, is, is still very much there. Um, what, uh, what, uh, what changed is basically a lot of the fine detail uh, in, that, in that protocol, which was either not in the white paper itself or uh, was later changed because, well, we found more efficient ways to, uh, to do it. So I think um, the, the basic idea that was presented in, in the white paper is still, uh, is still valid and is still there. Uh, however, the actual implementation and the actual protocol as it is right now, uh, I would probably not try to infer from that from that paper because it's it's very light on on the sort of details that you need to implement stuff. So for that, I would definitely suggest people go and read the specification that we wrote up during the last two and a half years now. Uh, and while that's still very technical, it's way more complete than. Uh, than the white paper. Yeah, I do a lot of like implement. I, you know, I, I keep up a lot with like the plasma uh, world. So you know, I, I I can see something very similar there, where the original plasma paper from Joseph Poon is like you know very interesting ideas, but very light on the details. And so then that's where like you know we have all this implementation work still to do and spec work to do. So very cool. And so you know. I guess when we had this uh, episode uh, with Joseph Poon and Taj back in uh, 2015, and then we also had one with Adam back in uh, 2015, and he was, you know, we were talking about Lightning, and he basically mentioned that, like, oh, you know, Lightning is a couple months out, four or five months out, and uh, so what happened there? <laughs> yeah, so th so that was a very interesting episode. Uh, I think. One of the one of the things that nobody was expecting is that uh, there was nobody that actually wanted to implement anything uh, in in this. Uh, so uh, Taj and and Joseph basically wrote this paper and and then only much later decided to to create a company, Lightning Labs, uh, to to actually go ahead and implement this. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, Blockstream had hired Rusty Russell, my uh, my colleague. Um, who got started on the uh, on the C Lightning implementation, and only when people sort of showed interest in that, only then Joseph mm -hmm. and 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 Taj uh, decided, hey, there, there's there's uh, there's a good way to create a uh, company out of this. Um, so I, I think the, the the first part of the answer is that nobody was there to sort of actually start implementing it, and sort of there was some hesitation in, in, in wanting to create this. Uh, and uh, the second part is that uh, uh, right from the get-go, we had this, this, uh, this uh, desire to create a specification that was sort of implementation agnostic. And so this is, this is not just one team that is trying to hack together a, a client as quickly as possible and uh, sort of taking shortcuts on the protocol side. But this is very much a community effort where we have multiple implementations that, that uh, try to come up with the uh, most efficient and most clear way to build this, uh, this protocol and then implement it. So that obviously takes time, but uh, there's, there's a lot of learnings we, we learned along the way. And uh, there was a lot of exp uh, there, there was a lot a long experimentation phase before we met in 2016 in Milan uh, for the first spec meeting where we said okay yes we want to we want to create a cohesive uh, um, specification and we want to make uh, we want to uh, put that effort into actually make this uh, a multi implementation network rather than everybody just going their own way. So what. What some of the uh, design choices around, like you know, deciding to go with this uh, multi-implementation model instead of like you know everyone kind of focusing their efforts on uh, C Lightning and and wh wh why did uh, we decide to go down this multi-implementation route? Well, there's um, there there's a lot to be learned from uh, from sort of uh, creating multiple implementations, right? We have we have more people that come in and look at things from it from a different angle. Uh, it also forced us to have this experimentational phase 
uh, before the Milan meeting uh, where everybody just went their own way and then sort of we came back and and sort of merged all of our uh, uh, lessons that, that we learned along the way. And then we threw everything away and then just started with the real specification, um, sort of a semi-clean slate uh, um, and uh, sort of, yes, ju just this, just this um, the advantage is basically that that we uh, that we have this uh, this very cohesive sort of specification that uh, that comes out of it, and the other side is that having a single implementation sort of uh, you have a single implementation that sort of tries everything and does nothing well, um, whereas with the current ecosystem we have uh, we have Eclair which are very much. Uh, 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 async with their client Eclair, which are very much focused on uh, on mobile clients. We have uh, Lightning Labs that are uh, with their LND are very much focused on uh, on desktop uh, users, and their C Lightning, which is mostly for uh, aiming for uh, power users that that sort of need a lot of customiza uh, customizability. And so there's different different goals we have uh, and different target audiences. But we still have this interoperability that that gives a, that is given to us by the by the specification that is implementation agnostic. It's also good to have the, all of this written down uh, and not in in the form of uh, an implementation. Otherwise, it gets really hard to reason about. Right, that's interesting. I mean, we we just had we did an episode with like Jameson Lop, I think, uh, last week, right, where we had some of that discussion around you know Bitcoin not having a specification, right, and having this kind of you know, single client. And I mean, it's certainly, yeah, I think that sounds, that sounds like a great uh, a path to take. Now you mentioned the specification, is that specification finished? Or is it still something that's being worked on? We've been wanting to tag version 1.0 for the last three months, I think. It's not been done so far, because there's always somebody who has who has an open pull request about spelling. <laughs> uh, but at this point, really, the 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 most of the changes that are applied to the version one point zero are uh, are about wording, and and we we hope to be able to tag version one point zero soon. Um, all of the implementations that that sort of have started this uh, this uh, process with us uh, have compatibility with version one point zero, uh, and we are already working on on features for one point one. But we'd like to to have this uh, version 1.0 out uh, out of the gate and sort of uh, be able to concentrate on the next big thing that that we might want to build in there. So not yet, but soon. Okay. As as, uh, okay, as so, you know, yeah. saying goes, is two weeks. Hiring is stressful. Let's face it; it's a long process of sifting through resumes and interviewing candidates without any guarantee of quality. But it doesn't have to be this way. Companies all over the place are experiencing a new way of hiring with TopTal. If you go to their Trustpilot page, you'll see that of the hundreds of people that have left reviews, over 98% were four or five star ratings, including one guy who wants to give his developer a bear hug. That says a lot. TopTal gets all this great feedback because they focus on their clients and their top priority is quality. They only accept the top 3% of applicants, including highly skilled blockchain engineers. One of these engineers is Radek Ostrowski, Rodak has experience as a lead software engineer and data scientist for Sony and Expedia. Then he discovered blockchain and he became totally consumed with Ethereum. He worked as a consultant for the firm Start On Chain, and his Time Locked app won the top quarter consensus Uport and Identity Blockchain Hackathon. Then he expanded his reach through TopTal. He worked with a bunch of clients on projects such as smart contract development and a POC that leverages blockchain. If you want to hire engineers like Rodak for your team, Go to toptal.com slash epicenter for a no-risk trial. A TopTal director of engineering will deliver your next hire in as fast as 48 hours, and you'll get a $1,000 credit when you decide to hire. We'd like to thank TopTal for their support of Epicenter. Okay, so we had like a, this b slow beginning, and then the specification work started in, in 2016 in Milan, and now it's kind of at the point of coming to a closure. If you look overall at the history of work on Lightning, where where has progress been fast and good and, and what have been maybe some obstacles that ended up taking a lot of time? So I think overall the, the progress has been has been 
rather quick and and uh, and uh, obstacle free. There have been a few cases where uh, we noticed that uh, uh, our initial simple uh, solution wasn't clever enough. Uh, for example, one uh, one thing that uh, continuously comes back to haunt us is uh, that we chose to sort of uh, uh, punt on a more complex gossip protocol in which we exchange information about channel uh, existing channels and existing nodes because we wanted to uh, we said okay we want to have a simple version first and then we will revisit that once we have uh, 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 once we have uh, gathered enough information about the, the situation this has turned out to be a bit more complicated than we expected simply because the gossip protocol is very chatty and especially on mobile nodes, this this chattiness is uh, is not desirable. Um, uh, but I think other than that, most of the stuff went went quite okay. Um, we've, I mean, between between the uh, uh, between the start of the standardization, which was in September twenty sixteen, to us uh, Blockstream opening the uh, the Blockstream store. There was little over a year, uh, and we basically had a rewrite of the entire client, and so did the other teams. Um, so I'm I'm quite happy with the progress we had so far. Uh, now there's quite a few people that, who say this isn't going fast enough, but you always have these people, right? So, uh, could you tell us a little bit about this, uh, you know, this uh, rollout phase that uh, happened for Lightning now? So, I remember, you know, I was in Berlin uh, about like you know last spring, and you know there was a whole Blockstream store, and that was like you know the first time anyone could buy anything with Lightning and like use it. And you know, the C Lightning client came out around the same time. I used that opportunity to buy the uh, shirt I'm wearing from the uh, Blockstream Lightning store, so I was pretty you know, excited. I got to be one of like the first early users of Lightning. So how has uh you know th this rollout happened over the past couple past year or so and how have we seen like adoption? Yeah, so um we we get we get asked quite a lot, quite often when are, is uh, Lightning the network going to launch uh, and my usual usual reply is it, it is launched. Um so um we had this we had this very slow and uh uh incremental rollout where uh we uh we basically created the client and sort of got some users on board uh, that that were really technical and that just wanted to play with this stuff. And uh, before uh, before the Blockstream store launched last year, uh, we encouraged everybody to basically use testnet and testnet only. In fact, all of our clients are still um, defaulting to testnet if you start them today, simply because we didn't we didn't want to uh, to uh, have people lose their money and sort of lose interest because of that. Um, this is this was a really early day software after all. Um, and we wouldn't feel comfortable losing user money at, the, at that point in time. It basically, we, we had a group of people that uh, were tech savvy and that were sort of hacking their way around the, the clients themselves and, and were sort of experimenting on mainnet already. And uh, at some point, we just decided, "Hey, uh, this is this is sort of this is sort of getting ahead of us." Uh, and uh, yes, we we'd like to open uh, uh, we'd like to open a shop where you can actually buy uh, items for real bitcoins, um, and sort of get that feedback from mainnet users ourselves, and sort of get uh, gather experiences on mainnet ourselves by operating the store. And so, in uh, I think it was January sixteenth, um, we basically uh, published that we had a running version of uh, of WooCommerce with a Lightning uh, with a C Lightning backend, uh, and you could actually go ahead and and buy stuff like you did, for example, um, and many other people did uh, since, um, and uh, it was sort of this slow and incremental rollout where you actually had to know a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, tech in order to get uh, to get to use it um, and uh, it, we always accompanied this with the with this sort of uh, hashtag reckless uh, which uh, was uh, was there to signify hey uh, by the way this is alpha state software please don't use this for any sort of real money just for 
uh, just for whatever you feel okay losing if the software is broken, for example. And uh, while we were uh, while we were gathering more and more feedback and uh, we're fixing more and more bugs, we sort of were also able to increase our confidence into the uh, implementations themselves. And so over this time, we started making it easier and easier for users to get started on Lightning. And uh, this is all part of this slow and incremental rollout that, that we wanted. Um, and uh, it's been working great so far. Uh, so there will will no will not be uh, an official launch date for for Lightning Network. It has been launched over a year ago, and uh, people have been joining whenever uh, whenever they feel like investing a bit of time. And eventually, we hope to make it easy enough for just everybody to to be able to to uh, to come and play with it. Are there any uh, known cases of anyone losing any money on Mainnet because of bugs in the software? I know that there is one that I caused, which is basically um, we had this uh, this situation where a user of ours uh, was reacted to a cheat attempt from his counterparty, and we ended up with this very strange situation where he got the other person's money, which is what is expected, right? He tried to cheat, so I steal his money, basically. Um, but he didn't get his own money back, um, which uh, turns out uh, I forgot to add a field to a database. So um, I tried to buy him a beer for those 10 euros that, that he lost. And uh, instead, he insisted on buying me a beer because he had a lot of fun with while playing. And while he still lost some money, uh, uh, we we kept this, these limits slow enough that that we could do this sort of uh, I buy you a beer and we're sort of even, right? And uh, no, we we've we've had a lot of luck with with the community members. Uh, uh, nobody really lost a lot of money, and um, everybody just played along re uh, very nicely. And sort of this enthusiasm that I just wanted to sort of buy you a beer because I caused the bug that lost you money. Uh, and he insisting that that I should get a beer instead. Uh, that, that's something that that is happens that is very sort of representative for the, the feeling in the community currently. Um, it's, it's very collaborative. Now, I remember in the past, one of the concerns that people had about Lightning was that there was the idea, okay, you're going to have these different channels, and it's good if you, if a channel is very powerful, if it's connected with many, right? So you have, you're going to have these hubs, and then there's this process where, okay, I want to pay Sony, but we don't have a direct channel, right? So we have to go through some, uh, some route, and then that route would generally go through, you know, particular particular hubs. And so there was this fear that, okay, isn't Lightning going to be a very centralized network? There's going to be a few companies that will, you know, have these big hubs, everyone will go through them. But what are your thoughts, first of all, on whether or not this is a problem, or the aspect of decentralization in Lightning, and kind of the role of hubs? Yeah, so um, that's, that's a point that comes up rather often. Uh, and I often get the feeling that people are scared of centralization, but for the wrong reasons. Because if if we have a participant in a network that has a lot of uh, channels open and that has sort of a lot of liquidity in, in his channels and therefore connects a lot of uh, people in the network, then that's for, that first of all is a service to the to the network itself by uh, by enabling the, this this multi hop routing from many points to many other points. It's first and foremost a downside because, well, uh, suddenly you become a single point of failure if you run this hub, right? Um, and that's that's the thing that that I'm worried about in uh, with these. If if the network turns out to be centralized, hubs sort of gather a lot of uh, a lot of responsibility on their shoulders, and if they go down, then suddenly the network is uh, a lot uh, a lot worse than. Uh, uh, than before, um, what I don't think uh, uh, is is a big issue, and which a lot of people point to, is uh, is this idea of 
big hubs being uh, being uh, able to de-anonymize people and sort of profiling their users. We have in the in the protocol specification itself, we have the uh, an onion routing protocol which allows uh, allows us to sort of hide the origin and the destination for uh, for all the payments we perform in the network. So all a big hub sees is that okay, I got a payment from the left, uh, I decrypted and I have my instructions uh, uh, from that packet, and I know where to forward it on my right. Um, they don't learn uh, anything about who the original uh, sender was because, well, only he only learns who the next, uh, the previous hop from the left was, and he will not learn anything about the, the actual recipient of the payment because, well, all he learned was who the next guy is. It could be the next guy is a recipient, but well, he doesn't learn anything about that. He doesn't learn his position in the route. He doesn't learn how many people are before him or after him. Quick question on that. So is this onion routing, that's something that like all of the clients do by default, or is that something you kind of have to, you know, optionally choose if you care about privacy a lot? No, this is, uh, this is the only way that we currently uh, implement sending uh, coins on the Lightning Network. So if you're using the Lightning Network, you are using the onion routing protocol. And uh, even if uh, even if you have a direct connection to your uh, to your recipient, he will not learn that you are the original sender. Uh, so this is to, we we decided to to make the onion uh, routing mandatory exactly because if it's an opt-in feature, then people might uh, uh, might not know that they should use it, or they might opt out from using it because well, crypto is hard. Um, so by making it by uh, by making it mandatory, every client has to implement it, and every client will use it for every single payment there is, and this creates uh, this creates a bigger set uh, of users in which we uh, in which an individual user can hide in. So, uh, but what what I was saying is that uh, the um, so the 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 central hub will not learn a lot about you unless. You, uh, your only connection is going to be uh, the hub because, well, then you can't say, hey, I got this from some guy that sent it to me, but they will know that that it's you, uh, which is why we encourage people to actually open multiple connections, at least to have this, uh, this plausible deniability that, uh, yeah, I'm not the original sender. I received it from some other guy uh, further down the line. Uh, so the hub doesn't learn a lot, uh, a lot about, uh, about, uh, privacy uh, uh, information, but it does concentrate uh, so, uh, a lot of connections on it, and uh, it represents a single point of failure, uh, which is what I care about. There's uh, uh, reasons for hubs to emerge, and there's reasons for hubs not to emerge. Maybe we can go into that later if you if you want to. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft and the Azure Blockchain Workbench. Getting your blockchain from the whiteboard to production can be a big undertaking. And something as simple as connecting your blockchain to IoT devices or existing ERP systems is a project in itself. Well, the folks at Microsoft have you covered. You already know about the Azure Blockchain Workbench and how easy it makes bootstrapping your blockchain network pre-configured with all the cloud services you need for your enterprise app. Their new development kit is the IFTTT for blockchains. Suppose you want to collect data from someone in a remote location via SMS and have that data packaged in a transaction for your Hyperledger Fabric blockchain. The development kit allows you to build this integration in just a few steps in a simple drag and drop interface. Here's another great example. Perhaps you're an institution working with Ethereum and rely on CSV files sent by email. One click in the dev kit and you can parse these files and have the data embedded in transactions. Whatever you're working with, the dev kit can read, transform, and act on the data. To learn more and to build your first application in less than 30 minutes, visit aka.ms slash epicenter. And be sure to follow them on Twitter at MSFT Blockchain. We'd like to thank Microsoft and Azure for their support of Epicenter. So with this uh, onion routing, so does it like similar to how in Tor, do we like select a bunch of extra random nodes to also send to like is part of our path or do we just like you know take the most efficient path 
uh, route that we can find, but the the nodes along that route don't know uh, who the other participants are. Yes, yeah, so the uh, the structure is very similar uh, with the two exceptions. Uh, one is that in Tor, you can actually select any uh, any participants in the network to be the next hop in your route. Um, this is not possible in Lightning. For, uh, Lightning, the uh, the hops have to match the actual channels existing. So um, if I uh, if I only have a channel open to you, then I can't sort of go around you and then send back to you. So our Onion routing hops have to coincide with actual channels existing. And as for your question about uh, whether we choose always the most efficient route, uh, we uh, we do randomize routes in such a way that uh, if there uh, if there is a w uh, if there is a shortest route from point A to B, we might not use that exactly because uh, that might uh, might leak information about who the original sender and who the re original recipient is. Uh, we randomize inside of bounds, however, so uh, we will select uh, uh, we will select routes that are up to a certain percentage worse than the optimal route. I see, I, and I guess that kind of leads into you know the other the next question. You know, one of the most common uh, questions we, you you often hear around like Lightning is this question of routing and how we can make this efficient. And you know, does this mean we need global routing tables and stuff? So you know, could you like maybe like you know address some of the like concerns there, and are they valid? Uh, is it something that like you know like yet to be figured out, or yeah? Sure. Uh, so uh, the uh, the current routing protocol is basically source based routing. So what we do is we create we gossip among the nodes about which channels exist and which nodes exist. We exchange messages that basically say, hey, there's a channel between me and uh, Brian. Uh, there is a channel between me and uh, Sonny. Uh, and, uh, and by gossiping, we incrementally learn about which channels are in there. And so we create our local view of the network. And based on this local view, we can then select a route from A to B uh, without involving any third party. Um, that has that has the huge advantage that we basically don't tell anybody uh, who the uh, who the endpoints are, but it has the downside that we need so we can do routing uh, decisions locally, but it has the downside that we actually have to maintain this local view of the network. Uh, there is a few different constructions where we uh, uh, that are under consideration or were under consideration for how we can improve this uh, uh, to be more efficient. And these usually come down to land-based, uh, uh, landmark-based and, uh, and um, rendezvous-based routing. So both of these basically say, hey, there's some very prominent no uh, nodes in the network that everybody sort of knows uh, uh, how to get to and how to get from them. Um, and let's just let's just meet at this very well known location in the network, and I will tell you how to route from that point to me, and you know how to create the the first half of this route, and then we can collaboratively construct this uh, this route. This has the downside of uh, of creating these uh, uh, of needing these uh, well known points in a network, and how we select these is is not it's not that clear yet. Um, but currently, the sort of everybody ha knows the entire network seems to be working well. And Rusty had a few numbers. I think that uh, up to a million channels, we should be able to sort of squeeze that in a few hundred megs of, of data. So not a huge problem right now. Uh, it's actually a luxury problem if we if we get there. Uh, and uh, and I guess we'll cross that bridge once a while once we're there. Um, that is to be said. Uh, uh, one thing that, that we might add here is that not all channels and not all nodes are public. Uh, so we tend to uh, we tend to announce channels that uh, uh, that might be used for routing for other people. But if we are just an end device that sort of is a client to the rest of the network, um, then we will not allow, uh, announce them. And that is something that uh, the uh, Eclair wallet does. It doesn't announce uh, its uh, its channels to the wider public because, well, they're running on a mobile uh, mobile phone, 
and they might not be stable enough to actually guarantee that they are there when users want to route through them. And the way we, we handle those is basically we add some information into invoices uh, so that uh, I say, hey, I'd like to be paid 10 bucks by you and here's how you can reach me. Basically just giving them a, a, a what's called a route hint to tell them, hey, there's a channel you might uh, might want to use if you want to pay me. And sort of there is this, this very well-connected and public core network that uh, that uh, routes payments from everybody to everybody else. And then there is this, this uh, auxiliary network of, of uh, ne uh, devices that uh, come online and go offline very quickly and are not as reliable. And, uh, uh, and they sort of represent the endpoints of, of users that do not want to route, but just want to use this network as, uh, as a client. Great. I, I would love to dive in a little bit the sort of the economics of Lightning Network. So in particular, in uh, right in Bitcoin, you the the amount of fees you pay, uh, you know, tends to be based on the the size of the transaction. Uh, so the size in terms of the data, uh, you know, not in terms of the value. Now in Lightning, right, because you're using up some Bitcoin that are locked. This is different, and it's going to be proportional to the amount transferred. Is that correct, or are there like other determinants that will uh, influence transaction fees? So, in uh, the, the reason why we use uh, we use weight based uh, fees in in Bitcoin is basically because the the contended resource in this case is the block space, right? And so, users that should that use more of it should pay more. Basically, that's the rationale behind it. In, uh, uh, in Lightning, it's uh, the contented resource is channel capacity. So if I have a $10 channel open with you and I send nine over, then I basically unbalance my channel in such a way that, well, any future payments that, that I, might, I might want to pay through that channel are, uh, are at a disadvantage. So uh, what we do is we, do, we have this, uh, we have a proportional fee that basically is denominated in millionths of Satoshi per Satoshi. Um, and sort of, so the minimum fee you can, you can have is zero or one millionth of a Satoshi for every Satoshi transferred. Yeah, so, so the, the, the scarce resource here is the capacity that we have in these channels themselves. Do you have any idea how these fees are going to develop once you know, the network's live? So you mentioned, okay, this is minimum default of 1 million for a, a Satoshi, but, you know, is it going to be that the more transactions take place, the lower the fees will be, or uh, how, how do you think this is going to play out? So my expectation is that uh, the more transactions we have, the more balanced these channels become simply because of uh, the uh, us, uh, us sort of moving away from a balanced channel as a random event and sort of uh, any transaction that modifies that balance is, is sort of a random, a two-dimensional random walk on that uh, event. Um, so my expectation is that fees will be minimal and, uh, and sort of be just there to compensate people for the uh, capital expenditure they had to create this channel. Um, so if I have uh, if I have one hundred dollars, I can I have a choice of investing that in, in in stock, or I can forego that option and uh, and create a channel instead. So there is some cost to operating a node, and that cost should be compensated by users taking advantage of this uh, of this cost. I don't think that there will be uh, there will be big hubs that can leverage higher fees because it's very easy to create alternative routes around these hubs. And, and sort of be just a little bit less than uh, than the huge fees. And so you create this race to the bottom for people that, that leverage, uh, that want to leverage high fees. And we'd like to actually encourage people to, uh, to look for these kinds of strategic positions where they can open a channel and sort of just undercut the, uh, the, the hub as long as the capital expenditure is not, uh, is not uh, is still covered uh, by the fees they may collect. So, I guess we will we will go to a uh, to a, a fee level that is very minimal and just covers the capital expense you have for opening the channel. 
So let, let's say now in the future, right? A lot, there are a lot of uh, sort of one of the interesting topics currently, especially in Ethereum, right? Is this a decentralized finance, so DeFi kind of trend, right? There are a lot of things that are taken under this umbrella, you know, things like Maker, where you can put up Ether and then you can get up some out some stable coin. Uh, and so there's generally a perspective there, and I think it's it's a correct perspective. A perception that you know there's going to be a lot of ways to actually use crypto and like earn money whether that's like whether you can stake it or maybe you can use it as some sort of security bond uh or you know there's you'll be able to lend it uh now presumably that's also going to happen in bitcoin right where you can uh maybe lend bitcoin and you know they have different ways of earning some money on it uh, do you think that's also one way to think about lightning? Maybe I, as a normal Bitcoin user, you know, down the line in two years or something, I'll be able to say, okay, I'm take my, I take a Bitcoin or take five Bitcoins, I put it in some lightning channels. Now it's use it's routing payments, and I make like I don't know three percent a year or four percent a year in terms of you know earning more Bitcoin for basically providing that capital there. I don't. I don't think lightning channels are a good investment at all. Uh, it's basically just if if you if you look at it from an investment side, uh, then and and you want to leverage higher fees, you're basically creating this island of high fees uh, uh, around you, and people that uh, that are happy to maybe only take two and a half percent will position uh, position themselves right next to you and sort of undercut you. Um, I think. Fees should mostly be thought of uh, uh, as amortization for your own investment or your own needs uh, when uh, as a user of the uh, of the Lightning Network. They're probably not a great business model to make money. Uh, so I can, if if I'm a regular user of the Lightning Network and I want to sort of reduce my my uh, my fee expenses for payments that I perform. Um, then I can route payments for other people, and every all the fees that I that I gather, I can then spend on uh, on my own expenses in uh, in the Lightning Network. So it's more of an amortization of, of fees that I incur as a user, rather than uh, I put some money in there and then I pull it out again, and then suddenly it's it's been multiplied. So recently there was this guy. Andreas Brecken, I think, and you know he was operating lots of Lightning uh, channels, and he had, I think, it was around fifty percent of all of the Bitcoin in the Lightning network at one point. And now, of course, Lightning is very early, and there's, you know, there's no real, so it's it's maybe dangerous to extrapolate from his experience to like what is Lightning going to look like when, when it's kind of really functional, really being used. But I, I mean, I think, uh, I guess that was one of the takeaways that. You know, he did, routed all of those payments and he made like a fraction of a dollar. Are there any other kind of interesting takeaways or lessons that you felt like I was kind of learned by people like him that are operating lightning channels today in terms of how it's going to play out once there is real adoption? I guess I, I guess Andreas Brecken's uh, experiment was was really early on and uh probably you're right that that extrapolating from from his experience is, is not uh, is not really feasible um, but only recently there there has been a uh, there has been a huge uh, operator of uh, of lightning nodes uh, uh, called lnbig.com um, which has opened a lot of high volume channel to a lot of people in the network and uh, they um, they recently published uh, uh, an article about how many uh, how many transaction fees they have gathered and how many. I think they also expose how many transactions they have forwarded, and it turns out they they didn't make a lot of money from it. Uh, now that could be that they're not positioning themselves so well, or that the 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 sort of fee structure they had is, is suboptimal. But I think that sort of adds uh, adds more credibility to the fees will not be gigantic, right? Again, these these players could increase the, the their local setting for fees, but uh, that also decreases the probability of people actually routing through them. Um, and I think, yeah, this this is sort of two separate experiences at a distance of 
half a year that show that the fees are not uh, are not really there uh, to be made and people people find the cheap ways to to uh, to route in the in the lightning network so another question i have about routing is uh a few months ago i was talking to zuko wilcox about some lightning stuff and one of the uh points he brought up to me was that he th he believes that there's a griefing attack possible where you know you can like send pay you can send payments to yourself and you know cause a lot of people along the route to lock up some capital and then you suddenly decide to not send any payments and uh you know you never have to pay any fees for this or anything and so you know and you could just keep dosing the lightning network and causing people to do lockups and then just like failing the transaction so is this a legitimate concern or uh, is this like an addressed issue uh, it is it is definitely a concern that we have uh it's uh possible to to lock up funds for certain periods of times um if you do it too long then your channel will be shut down uh, which is going to cost you some money but uh, for minutes or hours at a time it's definitely possible to lock up funds it's something that that we are hoping to address by uh, by adding fees outside of the transferred amount so whether or not a payment succeeds there is a fee involved um, but uh, as it as it stands currently it's it's not uh, it's not been addressed how would that uh outside of the payment amount like fee payment be done like how would that happen technically so the the reason why this griefing attack is free currently is that uh, basically what uh, what we do is we include the fee in the uh, uh, in the transfer itself, meaning that if the transfer fails, then the fees will get rolled back as well. Um, so uh, that uh, that turns out it en uh, enables a number of uh, nasty things. Uh, one is the griefing attack, and the other one is. Uh, is basically free probing of the network by sending uh, sending payments that are uh, that do not match an invoice uh, that is to be paid. However, um, the solution that we that we propose is basically to have this fee uh, be uh, should flow whether or not the, success, the transaction succeeds or not. So basically, what we what we currently do is uh, if I want uh, if I want to send uh, nine satoshis to uh, to Brian uh, through Sunny. Then I will send ten to you uh, with a prom. Uh, I will promise ten to you if you send the nine onwards to Brian. Uh, and if that uh, if the last top doesn't succeed, you don't get any uh, anything, right? You don't get your one satoshi in fees. And uh, the the solution that we are considering is basically uh, that I will send you one satoshi. I will send you nine satoshis, and those nine satoshis you will get when uh, uh, when uh, when you forward them to uh, to Brian. So that's sort of an out of band fee that allows us to have uh, uh, that to to force people to pay something, whether or not this uh, this payment succeeds or not. So so would you hear? make it so that you know let's say sunny sunny gets some fee anyway but he gets a larger fee in case he actually uh routes the payment or otherwise what's the incentive to to yes so so, so my example was flawed because uh, uh i started with uh 10 and 9 and didn't have any room to split that uh one but yes of course it, it would be it should be 11 uh uh, one you get up front and 10 you get when, when the routing completes and then sort of he, the 10th he get only gets when, when routing the nine onwards. That does sound like a pretty clean uh, solution. Well, let, let's speak a little bit about sort of the technical roadmap for Lightning. So you, we mentioned briefly L2, uh, which is a kind of a proposal, upgrade proposal that you worked on and, and published, I think, last April. Can you talk a little bit about what L2 would mean for Lightning? Yeah, so uh, L2 is sort of the 2.0 uh, uh, future. Uh, and and what we're currently working on is 1.1. 1 .1. uh, so L2 is, uh, is, a, uh, is a new construction of uh, payment channels that is uh, much simpler and reconnects, in fact, to the duplex micropayment channel idea. 
I, I say 2.0 because we actually require a change to the Bitcoin scripting language uh, called Sikash No Input, uh, which looks like we might get eventually. Uh, I'm not really good at making predictions when it comes to that ever since uh, SegWit activation. And uh, and once we once we have Ccash no input, we can actually build L2, which is this uh, which is this simpler construction, which we basically can say we can say okay, my current state is uh, if we go back to the barista, my current state is you get two and I get eight, and then we update a couple of times, and then we have five and five, and we can forget all uh, all the states we had before, which is currently not possible with Lightning. Uh, where in Lightning we have to keep part of the state for all previous states, so we can react uh, in, in in a correct way to whatever our current party might do. Uh, in uh, in L2 we have this last state, which basically trumps everything that has ever been before, and uh, and allows us to override whatever whatever our counterparty might might do with just keeping the latest state. Yeah, I, I, uh, Dan Robinson have, and uh, Lalu have a uh, bet, I believe, going on that whether SIG hash no input will be in by 2021. So. <laughs> oh, and yeah, um, Rosebeef also has has another construction which is uh, which is interesting, which is uh, check SIG from stack. Um, that also is a soft fork, and uh, it uh, we might we might end up compete with two competing proposals again and then sort of hash it out which one is is the cleaner and which one is the more flexible one um, but uh, yeah there there's there's quite a quite a few things we can do and uh, hopefully uh no input is less controversial than some other stuff that has come before and i'm pretty sure it is because i wrote a proposal and it's seriously like three lines of code it's really simple so you also mentioned uh, multi-party channels. What are those, and how would they change the Lightning Network? Yeah, so the current construction basically is with Lightning channels, we have uh, only two-party channels, meaning that I can only trade my coins with one other person, and we have to settle our uh, our state among ourselves. Um, this is due to, to the construction of Lightning, which uh, basically means that for every state that the counterparty might publish, I need to have a, uh, I need to have this uh, 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 reaction ready. So if we add more than uh, more than one counterparty, suddenly we have this this explosion of of possible misbehaviors, and uh, and we have to keep a uh, keep track of a lot of state. With L2 having the last state basically trump everything that came before it, uh, we don't we don't need to have a uh, custom tailored sort of, uh, reaction to whatever our current parties do, and this also means that we suddenly have uh, we suddenly don't care anymore about which counterparty misbehaves. We can just use our trump card, which is the latest state, and and just override whatever happened in between. So all of a sudden, it becomes possible for us. Three on the uh, on the on the uh, on the chat basically have one shared channel, and we can freely move uh, move funds from anybody to anybody else on the same channel. So uh, and we have constructions where we can go to fifteen or fifteen, or uh, once we have uh, once we have Schnorr signatures, we can we can go to arbitrary number of of participants, and that basically means that. Uh, we de-emphasize a bit the uh, reliance on multi-hop payments, because if uh, if I am in a group that uh, moves funds around often between the, its own participants, we don't need to leave the boundaries of our single channel, but we can adjust balances just by us. So if we go uh, go back to this example where we three now have uh, have one channel open and I put ten dollars in. And you both uh, have uh, zero in that. I can uh, I can decide to send nine to Sunny and one to Brian, and basically our latest state is zero for me, one for Brian, and nine for uh, for Sunny. And uh, and if we want to if we want to send back uh, any of this money, we can we can do so without ever involving some other channel in in the wider network. And this creates a whole lot of, of interesting uh, interesting scenarios we can do. We suddenly can uh, we can suddenly no longer uh, 
not only transfer Bitcoins, but we might be able to transfer unique assets among ourselves. Because one of the uh, one of the principal assumptions in the Lightning Network is that it doesn't matter which coins you you get exactly. Uh, all coins are fungible. So if I send one Bitcoin to Sunny and Sunny forwards it to you, uh, then uh, then the coin that you receive is not the one that I sent, right? Whereas in a uh, in a multi-party channel, we can actually handle unique assets among ourselves. So I can actually send you one Bitcoin, and the one that is going to arrive at your uh, at your uh, on your balance is going to be the same Bitcoin that I sent. Uh, and so if you were to, for example, create crypto kitties on, on, uh, on one gigantic uh, payment channel, we could actually send these unique assets among ourselves without ever involving the blockchain, without ever involving any party outside of the channel itself. Two of the uh, features I've, you know, I read about a little bit, uh, which I was sounded interesting to me, were one of them was uh, this idea that you could do atomic multi-channel uh, send. So let's say I have like, you know, five channels of two Bitcoin each, but I'm trying to send 10 Bitcoin. I can somehow have a system in which I can atomically send uh, all of them. Uh, and so I either make the full payment or not. Is this something that's um, implemented right now? Or is this like a future uh, prop upgrade? Yeah, so that's that's part of the 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 one point one push that we started in November uh, during our second spec meeting. This basically uh, gave us a chance to pull up all the features that we thought about, but didn't want to have in the first version because, well, that would have postponed the release of of the spec itself. So now we we dug up all of the nice features that that we that we thought about and that we know are possible right now. Uh, but haven't been specced yet. And one of these is indeed the the uh, the atomic multi-party payment, uh, the multi-part payment. And and as you as you said, it allows us to to basically bundle the capacity of multiple of our channels to create uh, to perform one big payment instead of uh, instead of being limited by the capacity of our biggest channel, basically. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, the other one I was interested in was uh, splicing, which uh, is, can you uh, maybe describe that? And is that also in this like 1.1 1 .1, uh, spec? Oh, definitely. Uh, splicing basically is an idea uh, I had a few uh, during the first spec meeting, and it basically allows us to, uh, to close the channel and reopen it in the same transaction and uh, sort of add new funds to it or uh, or, or move funds out of the channel without the channel ever becoming uh, becoming unavoid uh, unavailable. So uh, the idea here is basically that if we have a channel and it's really on balance and you own all the funds, but I want to use this channel to send you some money, then I can basically take some other coins I have uh, lying around on chain. We can uh, agree to perform a splice um, and I can add these funds during this close and open operation to our to the channel balances uh, so that allows us to uh, to move funds from on chain into channels that already exist and the channel remains operational while we do so and uh, the uh, the counterpart to this is uh, what we call a splice out which basically allows us to I have uh, I have a lot of bitcoins on my side and I'd like to for example perform an on-chain payment then we agree to perform a splice out. And part of this close and reopen transaction is that part of the funds that were, uh, were owned by me will go to a new output, which is then destined for my, uh, for my own chain, uh, on chain uh, payment recipient. And these, these two proposals, the, uh, the multi part payment and the, uh, and the splicing, are part of a wider uh, initiative where we try to sort of hide many of the technical details of, uh, of the Lightning uh, Network uh, in such a way that it becomes more intuitive for users to, um, to use Lightning. Because what, uh, what multi-party payment basically allows us is, uh, multi-part payment, I should say, um, allows us to do is not care anymore about the how we allocated funds to a channel if I have uh, if I have ten one Bitcoin channels or I have one one uh, ten Bitcoin channel, 
it doesn't make any difference for me because I have uh, I have this uh, I can bundle the capacity of multiple channels, so I don't care about channels anymore. Um, and the uh, splice in and splice out proposal basically uh, removes this barrier between on-chain funds and off-chain funds because all of the sudden my uh, off-chain funds that are uh, that are allocated to a, a Lightning channel I can still use to make online uh, on-chain payments. So the ultimate goal for us is to basically create a wallet that displays one balance to you, whether there, and that that basically contains both your on-chain balance as well as your off-chain balance and have channels uh, be handled automatically in the background, sort of removing this, this sort of complex uh, issue of having to explain to your users what, what channel is and how to best open and create and how to allocate them and all of these thorny details that users currently have to deal with. That sounds really fantastic. Actually, I think that was always a little bit my uh, a concern I had. You know, so okay, how do you manage this channel? So now you have just too many funds in there, and and now you want to take some out again. You have to close the channel. But that sounds like a very clean way of managing that. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's. Uh, it's still early days, and so uh, all of these technical details are are really hard to explain to users which is why we currently concentrate mostly on tech savvy uh, users that uh, that sort of want to dig into the technical details and that have time to to dedicate to researching these issues and and these topics but the end goal it really is to create a, a software that takes care of all of these details for you and all you have to care about is basically, uh, do I have enough money to buy my coffee? Uh, whether that's on-chain or off-chain, or do I have enough channels? That should all be handled in the background without you ever having to learn about it. If you want to, that's great, but you shouldn't have to. So I'll, I'll say this, I'm not, I haven't done too much uh, Bitcoin development. But I've done uh, I've done a couple of payment channel implementations on Ethereum and on um, the Cosmos SDK, and so one of the things I, the questions I have is like how much of the complexity of you know Lightning development is coming from like limitations in the Bitcoin state machine and like for my and like you know also like the statefulness of like other systems seems to like also add a lot of additional functionality where you can do you know. Uh, so there's a there's a proposal called sprites channels, which makes it easier to close like uh, defunct routes. Uh, there's a you know I think it's easier to make much more powerful watchtowers and stuff. So even when it comes to Bitcoin, like what 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 is the benefit of deploying a Lightning network on the main chain versus, for example, creating a side chain to Bitcoin and deploying the Lightning network there, where that side chain may have more stateful capabilities. Yeah, so um, regarding your second point, uh, why deployed on uh, on the Bitcoin main chain is, well, basically our users are there. That's where people get the most usability, uh, uh, the, the most utility from, and that's where we want to use it ourselves, right? Adding adding side chains is, is great for uh, to add to add special functionality that you can't do in, in Bitcoin or that we haven't figured out how to do in Bitcoin itself just yet um, but uh, it it's uh, it's it's a hurdle to get users on board right um, whereas Bitcoin if you if you already have Bitcoin you can use lightning right now um, as for uh, the uh, the need for statefulness and the need for uh, more advanced uh, smart contracts we find time and time again that uh, it turns out that we can backport a lot of stuff that uh, that come from the state channels and the Ethereum uh, uh, community um, into into Bitcoin, maybe in a bit more complex way, uh, but we can uh, we can often do without the uh, the added complexity of uh, of actually running a stateful chain uh, such as Ethereum. One of these examples for uh, is uh, that uh, I gave a lecture in Stanford last year after publishing L2. And it uh, and just before the uh, uh, before the lecture itself, uh, I was challenged to uh, to see if I could implement L two in Solidity, 
And uh, it turns out it's something that we can do in like 20 lines of code. And uh, the code actually looks a lot like uh, like Raiden. Uh, so uh, sud uh, suddenly we had this very roundabout way of, uh, of creating something that was made for Ethereum and backported it into Bitcoin itself uh, without all the additional cost and, and, uh, and sort of heaviness that, that comes with Ethereum. I'm not going to make a lot of friends by saying this, but I consider Ethereum a, a great test net for Bitcoin. <laughs> Yes, that makes sense. Like, you know, I, I I was just really thinking that, you know, I, I I really how I see like, you know, what my vision would be like, I really want to see a special side chain that's designed for lightning uh and state channel networks just be deployed as soft forked in as an official so, uh, merge mind chain to uh, an official drive chain to uh Bitcoin that's you know, its whole purpose is designed to be a lightning network and you know, it can be in a semi-official capacity and, you know, hopefully UX can kind of like, you know, hide a lot of that away. Just as, you know, just like you mentioned, we're, you're trying to hide a lot of the complexity away from the users anyway. So hopefully that that that, that special drive chain can be hit, that complexity can also be hidden away from users as well. I, I wouldn't actually be sure that, that a special side chain would be more uh, suited for uh, uh, for payment channels than uh, than Bitcoin itself, simply because when the, the way I came up with uh, or we came up with L two is uh, by taking by taking a step back and looking at what what sort of the minimal set of uh, of features that we need from a blockchain to make uh, uh, to uh, to create a, a blockchain that is purpose built for payment channels, and it turns out. This, uh, the, the, uh, the difference between this idealized payment channel enabling uh, blockchain and the currently deployed Bitcoin network is really just this one uh, sig hash. Uh, so I'm not sure I could come up with a, with a side chain or a drive chain that is better suited for payment channels than Bitcoin with sig hash no input, for example. Uh, and this this sort of convergence uh, uh, between between Ethereum, where you actually have all of the all of the flexibility, uh, and uh, where where you have where people have come up with Raiden and L2, uh, which count, comes from this more constrained version of uh, uh, of a blockchain, where we don't have all of this flexibility, and we still have very much the same uh, the same result. Is uh, is for me very much a proof of that. Yeah, this this is the functionality we need. We don't need more. Cool. So let's wrap up. And well, before we wrap up, briefly look out a little bit. Now, I think currently, when people were writing these sort of 2018 reviews, you know, Lightning was often coming up and say, okay, Lightning has seen a lot of development, you know, there's really progress, there's more momentum building, and now we have, you know, $2 million or something like that that are held, worth of Bitcoin, they're held in Lightning channels. So what's your, you know, what's your expectation about where we'll be a year from now, you know, at, at the, you know, what kind of, will we see, you know, real traction with people using Lightning for payment or... What do you think is kind of the timeline that a lightning adoption will take? I should probably preface this by saying that I'm really bad at making predictions. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, always, I'm always amazed about how quickly all of this has, uh, has materialized. I would not have expected to have uh, 20,000 channels and 600 Bitcoins in the lightning network at this point. Um, it's it's been a very frightening ride, but also a very sort of uh, uh, self-affirming uh, uh, ride for me so far. Uh, and as for predictions, I would probably guess it's more of the same. <laughs> um, I'm I'm hoping the network will will continue to grow um, at the current pace. Uh, it doesn't have to accelerate, uh, in my opinion. Um, and uh, I, I would love to see uh, to see some some real world adoption with with some games coming out with some uh, with some merchants accepting lightning uh, with uh, with some yeah just just give back uh, go back to this to this uh, 
use of Bitcoin as a as a currency and uh, sort of opening up new use cases uh, as we go along. On the spec side, I can I can probably speculate a bit more. Uh, we have this we have this 1.1 roadmap which we are currently implementing and uh, and hopefully we will we will be able to uh, to say in the next year or so that that we accomplished every single point of that and and that we now need a new meeting to to fix the next roadmap. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's probably all I can say when when it comes to predictions. I'm as I said, I'm not really good at that. Cool. Well, um, Christian, thanks so much for coming on. It was a real pleasure to, you know, catching up on Lightning. I think it is certainly something that excites me a lot to see how this is gonna, uh, how this is gonna play out. And yeah, so let's, uh, you know, let's let's keep following it. And I'm sure it's not the last episode about Lightning that we've done here. So thanks so much. Sure. No problem. Pleasure being here. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guest, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.